uh, down at the bottom, it says security, lock meeting, enable waiting room, um, share screen, rename themselves. Okay. Oh, allow participants to share screen and rename. Record button. <clears throat> This is me, I'm Jim Mall. I'm the Florida Friendly Landscape Program Coordinator here in Pasco County. And behind the scenes is Elizabeth. Elizabeth, you can unmute for a second and say hello. Hi everyone, I'm Elizabeth, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for helping me too, because that makes it smooth uh, behind the scenes uh, working on it. All right, so we're here to talk about Compost Happens. And I chose that title on purpose because there are books written that are, you know, two inches thick on composting and it makes it sound like it's very, very difficult. And like I like to say, compost will happen even if you don't do a whole lot or don't do it perfect, it'll eventually become compost. So this is one of these DIY projects you really can't goof up. So that's what I really like about it. So why do we compost? This is probably an underestimation, but about 20% of the landfill is yard waste. You know, and nobody wants a landfill in their backyard. So this extends the life of landfills where we have to get rid of trash. Um, so 20%, uh, we can do a lot better at reducing that and turning uh, those waste products into, into literally gold for uh, gardeners. Improve the soil, um, depending on where you are and where, you know, what you're experiencing where you live. Uh, most of us have poor sandy soils. Uh, where I live in Brooksville, uh, I have terrible hard uh, clay soils that don't drain real well. And what's interesting about compost and organic matter is it improves sandy soil, it improves clay soils. It, it's a magical substance in many, many ways. In sandy soil, it's going to improve that water holding ability. It kind of works like soil glue. I like to think about soil glue. And then slowly allocate it back out to plants. Whereas in clay, it breaks up those hard particles that make um, drainage so poor. We don't think of soil and uh, microorganisms. Um, microorganisms have been getting a lot of talk lately, as we know, but there's a lot of good beneficial microorganisms in the soil. Beneficial fungi, beneficial bacteria. Many of our plants will uh, 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 form uh, symbiotic relationships with these uh, organisms and together they're better, kind of like you and your other half, right? <laughs> um, it reduces uh, the rate of nutrient uh, release. It, it's a buffer. So if you slightly over apply fertilizer, not that I'm saying you should, it'll buffer that potential for burning. It improves plant and root growth. The plants like to be in those particles where the soil is better, it's moister, no more nutrients. Also, compost can help suppress plant disease. We don't talk about that much, and unfortunately, it's not as well researched as it probably could be. What to compost? Um, lots of things in our landscapes and our kitchens can be easily compostable. Leaves, uh, I know a lot of people worry about oak leaves, but oak leaves can be composted. Your yard clippings, if they're not too big and uh, you don't have to chip them down, easily are compostable. I see someone else entered the room. Let me hit that enter. Uh, grass and lawn clippings can go into the compost pile, um, but probably the best way to compost grass clippings or lawn clippings, however you want to think about them, is to let them go right back from the lawnmower back to the ground over the top of the grass. So once they don't clump up, they'll break down very, very quickly. Now, I know a lot of people think grass clippings are the cause of thatch. Grass clippings are between about 85 to 90 percent water. So they're returning the nutrients uh, back to the soil. And if you uh, mulch your grass clippings right back into your turf, that's about the equivalent of one free fertilization in a year. Now, some of you are woodworkers. Uh, you can compost wood chips. Uh, it takes a while for wood chips to break down. I know some of our Master Gardener volunteers who will get um, big um, loads brought to their landscape and after a couple of years in place uh, that'll be the new vegetable garden plot. Uh, sawdust can also be composted but it takes a very long time because those particles are so so small that air doesn't get it between the particles and needs to be fluffed up with some other things and I'll talk about that as well. 
probably the one thing all of us really should be composting is uh, those various kitchen scraps from uh, preparation of vegetables and fruits in our in our land uh, in our kitchens. <clears throat> manures can be compost. I'll be talking about some limits on that in a second. So manures, other things, uh, paper can be composted, but if you take a stack of newspapers and tuck it into the compost pile, all those layers just mat together and you won't get a whole lot of air between. It would take a long time, but shredded paper from like your um, paper shredding machines, that can be composted. Hold on one second, don't want to advance. Sometimes there's a lag. Ah, there it goes. What not to compost. Um, let me address this right now, human waste. I know I'm sure there's some uh, cyber you out there in your homes, um, but we need to deal with this because I know there are cultures where they will use human waste in their compost system. Um, again, this can transmit diseases. So no human waste, please, and pet waste. Um, you know, your dog, your cat, meat-eating creatures, you don't want to compost their manures. Um, you know, I know people that want to take that litter box, and I get it, trying not to throw things away, but uh, cat, um, cats can spread disease to human called toxoplasmosis, which is a quite serious disease uh, to, to get and to be treated for. So uh, best thing to do is dispose of pet waste properly. Chemically treated wood, as I was talking about woodworkers, if you're making a new raised bed and you were to use a pressure treated lumber, don't compost that. Don't compost a, a wood that's been treated with that um, borates uh, for termite control, for dry wood termite control. It's been painted with that very dark blue um, paint that, so you can see that it's been actually treated. That has a borate or a boron based um, component and that would be something I would not put in the compost pile as well. Here's definitely three things to remember never to compost. No meat, no grease, and no bones. So I can't hear you, but just say it out loud at your home even though you're on mute. No meat. Come on, Elizabeth. No meat. No meat. No grease. No grease. No bones. And no bones. Thank you for helping us. All right. No meat, no <laughs> grease, no bones. Uh, those will draw vermin, they'll cause bad odors, uh, even um, uh, cooking oil, even if it's vegetable oil, that's a grease. So do not compost uh, waste cooking oil because that will uh, bring on terrible odors in a compost pile. And they Dairy, attract uh, rodents too, right, Jim? It will attract all sorts of wonderful vermin. Yes. So no meat. No grease. No, and no bones. And no bones. Dairy products, avoid dairy products. You can put in eggshells, but don't put in milk or cheese or butter or something like that. If the plant, you're not sure why it died and you think it may have a disease, um, best just to throw that away because diseases, unless you're composting very hot, and I'm talking about 140 degrees Fahrenheit, um, some of these diseases will survive the composting process and could be spread to your vegetable garden or other landscape plants in the future. If you have weedy plants and they're full of seeds or fruit or something like that, unless you're composting very, very hot for a very long time, those seeds will not be, um, uh, they'll be viable. So you may serve to propagate weeds if you incorporate them into your um, compost pile. So best to throw out weeds that have um, seeds or fruit uh, into the garbage or destroy them in some other way like burning if you can. Plants, Peter, plants, treated with pesticides, uh, specifically weed killers. Um, those that are, have insecticides will break down, but herbicides, depending on the herbicide you're using, can uh, last for a while, even during the composting process. All right, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, components of a compost pile, moisture, uh, kind of Goldilocks here, don't want it too wet or too dry. Just right in the middle, aeration, not real saturated with, or low oxygen, high oxygen would be better. Pile temperature, not much over 140. If it goes below 140, 130, 120, composting will just slow down. Now remember, the title of this topic was compost happens. If you compost hot, you'll get end results much more quickly. If you're more like me and you kind of put it at the top of the compost pile, 
and then take it out from the bottom of the compost pile. It's a longer process. I don't particularly like doing a lot of that turning, but other people find that somehow therapeutic. Particle size, if you have a big log, you know, big chunk of a log, it's gonna take a very long time to break down. If it's chipped up, it's gonna break down more quickly. Now, if the particle size gets small like sawdust, then the air can't get through in between those particles and then the composting process slows down. But again, in spite of it all, compost will happen. Carbon to nitrogen ratio, a lot is written on this and I'll talk a bit about it in a moment, um, but it's the ratio of carbon, uh, which is the brown stuff is what we usually call it, to the nitrogen, which is the green stuff. Uh, they may not be exactly those colors, but those are terms we a lot of times will use. Moisture, the microbes, um, the, how is it breaking down? There are microbes that are on the plant material, vegetable scraps, all that stuff that will do the breakdown and they need moisture. Um, if your compost pile is soggy wet because of the heavy rainy season, the air goes down and then the microbes can't breathe and they slow down their ability to break down compost. The ideal moisture level is between 40 and 60%. No one is measuring it with some scientific instrument in their backyard, so don't panic. Compost happens. Best way to do it is touch it. If it feels kind of like a, a, a sponge that's been squeezed out of the moisture and it's still kind of damp, that's the ideal uh, soil moisture level of, in the compost pile. So it should feel just moist, but not soggy. Now, if you're getting ample rain, you may not need to add water. Sometimes we need to actually put a lid over it, not to keep out the air, but to keep out the heavy rains of the rainy season. Some people use like uh, uh, that corrugated plastic uh, uh, roofing material uh, for that or some other um, thing, a tarp. Uh, but during the dry season, usually April, May, although it varies, uh, you may actually need to add moisture uh, to your compost pile so the microbes don't get too dehydrated. So check out moisture levels with some frequency. I do have a question, Jim, if I can chime in. Um, so how, is there like a recommended um, amount of feet that you should compost from like your your house or like from your front door or something like that? Like a recommended? No, uh, but oops, sorry about that. I'm trying to work some things behind the scene. Um, you probably wanna put your compost pile in an area that's acceptable to your HOA, if you live in an HOA community. The front door probably is not where they're gonna want it. Um, but you know, put it somewhere where it's convenient and probably not in the full blistering sun because if you're gonna be turning and stirring and all that, that's a hot area to work in. Mm -hmm. And the heat that I'm talking about, that 140, is not coming from the sun hitting the pile, it's mm -hmm. from the microbes and their heat generation. It's kind of like us, we're generating heat. We're not getting it from the outside world. Thank Make you. sense? Makes sense, thank you. <clears throat> Microbes, uh, uh, what, what, what was I trying to say here? I can't think of what I was trying to say here. Thanks Elizabeth for the, for the smile though in the background. Uh, aeration, the, oh, if the pile gets really uh, kind of um, wet, you can aerate it by turning and adding bulky items like fluffed up leaves. Um, you know, don't be afraid of composting leaves. A lot of people are. Pile temperature depends on the size. You're not going to get heat out of a pile that's less than about three feet square. Or three, uh, yeah, three feet square. Uh, at anything smaller just doesn't have enough um, mass to generate the heat to that 140. You don't have to get it to 140. It just works faster destroys uh, bad weeds, seeds, bad diseases, and things like that. Now you can buy long probe, as you can see here in the picture, uh, thermometers that will measure the te uh, temperature in the center of the pile. If the pile goes above about 150, that's getting too hot and it actually can kill the microorganisms. If you've ever made uh, bread or yogurt and put too hot uh, milk in or too hot of uh, water for the yeast or something like that, you can kill it. So kind of keep that in mind, about 140, 150 is about where you want to not go any further than that. Um, I have seen compost piles. Um, I can think of a really good example at Walt Disney World. Years ago, I went behind the scenes and they have 
these huge long windrows that were taller than I am, which is over six feet. And they were about mm, six feet wide. And they had this neat machine that stirred on the sides and stirred on the top. And it went down these big long windrows, turning this um, mixture of landscape material and um, Disney treats their own sewage. So they had a lot of sewage sludge. And this was in August. And the heat coming from the pile when we walked out was even hotter than Florida in August. You could actually feel the heat just radiating off this pile. They were making compost as fast as possible because they need to get rid of the landscape material and well, the sewage sludge and they returned it back to the plant material, which you know was all good stuff. Um, but the fragrance from that was unforgettable. Let me tell you, if you ever get a chance to see that uh, setup, it's worth a go. Um, so I talked about browns and greens a few minutes earlier. Um, browns are the things that decompose slowly. We usually mix them with greens to speed up the decomposi decomposition process. Uh, the browns provide the carbon, whereas the greens provide the nitrogen. <clears throat> Good examples of browns are straws and leaves, not soda straws, you know, straw from like grass straw, uh, leaves, oaks, maples, any of that. Uh, chip branches, if you have a tree trimmed and you can get it chipped up, that would be an example of brown stuff. Uh, paper, again, I have taken my um, paper shredder material and put that in the compost pile. Sawdust, again, I've mentioned that several times, but you got to mix it with something to fluff it up and aerate it. No, if I can chime in on that last um, slide, um, Jim. Uh, so sawdust, so uh, we switched to, um, from clay litter to pellets, to pine pellets. So now we have pine litter for the cats. Uh, again, that uh, would be verboten. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Because, so even the, uh, there the, is a potential for disease transmission to humans gotcha. from, even if you scooped away the, the clumps and the clumped up material, uh, that whatever that base is, is potentially still contaminated with microorganisms that can transmit to us. So I know it's Earth Day and we want to go greener, but this is the time. There are things that we just need to throw away sometimes. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, so no, no, no pet waste unless you have a vegetarian creature like a bunny rabbit. And I know people that will have bunny rabbits and compost that manure, but dog and cat, please don't. And the litter box if you have a, you know, have that. The green, oh, I thought I saw somebody entering the room. Sorry about that. Uh, the greens decompose more quickly. Your, your grass clippings decompose very, very quickly if they don't clump up on the lawn. Uh, these are full of nitrogen and are the food source for the various microorganisms, the bacteria, the fungi that are breaking down uh, the materials. Great examples, grass, if you want to compost it in the pile, I prefer to do it right on the lawn. Uh, green leaves, kitchen scraps, your kitchen scraps are some of your best things to compost and a great way to start with children and getting them interested in that. Um, you know, just having a little container by the sink with a lid that you can put those scraps in and then uh, put it into the um, compost bin outside uh, every day or two. Uh, some people will add inorganic fertilizers. That doesn't mean they're uh, bad things if they have a lot of brown material like wood chips and they need to break it down quickly. So they'll throw a handful of a uh, high nitrogen fertilizer to jumpstart the breakdown of that. Coffee grounds full of good stuff to return to the earth. Um, Eggshells as well. <clears throat> All right, uh, I talked about the carbon, that's the C to N nitrogen ratio. The ideal is 30 to one. Now remember the topic of this, of this talk is compost happens. So even if you're not ideal at the 30 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio, it'll eventually break down. It may take a long time. It may just be delayed by a few weeks or a few months. And a lot of our kitchen scraps, coffee grounds, grass clippings, as you can see, all have that virtually ideal 30 to one uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio. Um, corn stalks, not that most of us are growing corn, but if you've ever tried to compost that down, it takes a while because they're 
they're kind of high in the carbon to that nitrogen ratio. So mixing in coffee grounds and grass clippings and veggie scraps would speed that up. Now I've talked about wood, sawdust, wood chips. This is why your mulch in your landscape takes a while to break down. But I'm sure a lot of us who have ever mulched in Florida with a, a two to four inch layer of mulch know we got to replenish it about a couple of times a year to maintain that uh, level. So in a compost pile, if it's nothing but wood chips, it'll take maybe two or three years, depending on how big the size is. You know, a log, big chunky logs can take forever. But the things that come out of a chipper shredder by a professional, about two or three years. Straw, again, some people have used that as mulch more than uh, compost, but again, it takes a while. Oak leaves are surprisingly close to the carbon to nitrogen ratio, but if you've ever put them in a compost pile, you've noticed it takes them kind of a long time to break down. That's because they're covered on the top and the underside with wax to make them drought tolerant. So if you can run your lawnmower over them, they'll break that waxy layer and speed it up. Pine needles are also kind of slow to break down because of that carbon to nitrogen ratio. I mentioned paper can be composted, but if you have stacks and stacks and stacks, kind of like lasagna, um, to get a visualization um, of newspaper, it'll take a very long time because the air isn't getting through, but your chipper shredder material uh, composts down very, very quickly. It's a relatively small particle. So who are the players in composting? Um, the microorganisms that are naturally in the environment all over the place on all the surfaces of the things that you're gonna compost. They could be bacteria, they could be fungi, especially in um, the warm composting or hot composting, it's gonna be bacteria and fungi that are generating the heat. Uh, if you're cold composting where it's ambient air temperature, whether it's 90 degrees out or it's 55 because it's winter, Usually a lot of times there's bacteria and fungi doing it, but you may have insects in there. Cockroaches break down organic material. I know we get grossed out when you see a cockroach in the cool compost systems, but they're actually returning all that goodness back to the earth and they're really not a bad player out there. Uh, some people will compost with various worms. Uh, that's a whole nother topic uh, called vermiculture. I will say this, if you are deciding to go the worm route, do not go to the bait uh, section of the store or the sporting goods store and buy uh, night crawlers. Their name tells you what they do at night. They crawl out of your pile and they do not find their way back. There are specific composting worms out there and you can WW uh, and find that on the internet. But that's another topic. And if you're interested, I'm sure I'll give that one of these days. Just keep on following us on like Facebook. Um, here's where a lot of people who are organic vegetable gardeners make a big mistake. Um, they have issues with their vegetable garden. If it's not a timing issue, it's usually a fertility issue. Many times I'll have somebody coming in, the plants aren't really producing very well. They'll tell me they're an organic vegetable grower, which is fine. And I'll say, what are you using for fertilizer? And they'll say, compost. And as you can see clearly in the top of the slide, compost is not fertilizer. Now, if you remember early on in this talk, I called it soil glue. It's holding onto those nutrients and then slowly releases it over a long period of time. So you still have to supplement with fertilizer. You can get natural or organic uh, fertilizers in garden centers uh, all, all throughout the county and other counties if you're not in Pasco listening to us today or in the future on this recording. So again, but you've got to give a fertilizer. Remember, it's holding it on and slowly returning it back to the plants. So compost will not provide 100% of the plant's nutritional needs during the growing season. Now, I kind of go back to the worm composting. Worm castings, um, those that has been processed through the worms themselves do have a little more nutrients, but again, you still will need a fertilizer source, even if you're using worm castings. Uh, hot or fast composting, a lot of people have ever uh, been in a magazine or seen something on the internet, <clears throat> excuse me, that, you know, claims to be able to create compost in two weeks. Uh, don't believe it unless you are Walt Disney World and have a big machine stirring it all the time and have access to getting everything perfect. Um, but those are fast systems that are hot. 
like I said, usually around 140, 150. They have to be a fairly large pile for the heat to build up, to have that thermal mass, and everything has to be in that perfect 30 to one ratio uh, to get that really super fast compost. So a lot of us won't be composting that hot uh, for various reasons. It's, it's not easy to do. It takes a lot of time and a lot of uh, know-how. Most of us will be doing it much more like I do it. If you look at the picture of the orange peels and the leaves and the pine needles, and all, well, that looks kind of like my backyard. No, it's not my backyard, but not too far from that. So what I do is when I get uh, scraps in the kitchen and that I put at the top of the, of the pile, which is, you know, a round bin with uh, some holes on the side, as you can kind of see there. And I put it on the top of the bin and after a while, I just keep on adding. And after one to two years, I go way to the bottom of the pile. I lift up the sides of it and get in there and I dig around and guess what I have? Compost, because compost happens. This is a lazy man's way of doing it. I'm here saying it out there for you to hear it. Hopefully you're getting a little bit of a chuckle too. Sheet composting, I'll talk a little bit about that, but these uh, sheet and trench composting methods are what I call composting in place. And sometimes this may be your only option in the HOA. Ah, you can even do it when Gladys Kravitz is watching you all the time. You dig a small little hole and you put your coffee filter and a couple of peels of uh, carrots and whatnot from dinner the other night, cover it back up and no one knows, you know, it's great. And it's a way to compost, even in, in these communities that don't allow a compost bin or pile. I've never understood some of these methods. Remember I said some of these books are out there two inches thick and tell you all these things and all of a sudden it's like, gee, I have to pick a method? Well, you could if you want. There's that sandwich method, three inches of this and alternate with browns and three inches that and alternate with, with green and all that. And then usually after they tell you to sandwich and layer it in these three to four inch layers, you read the last sentence of that whole big thick book and it says, stir everything together. Seriously, I've read material like that. Side note, if you've ever seen in a book that says add lime, I know some of you probably uh, wondered why. It's usually to prevent an odor. Now, Elizabeth, you are my eyes and ears and my mouthpiece. What are the three things we shouldn't put in the compost pile that can cause an odor? They're what? Uh, grease, bones, and meat. Right, so thank you. Meat, <laughs> no meat, no grease, no bones. There lime is. isn't going to kill the odor, folks, if you put meat, grease, or bones. The other problem with lime and compost piles, it ups the pH. And our soil pH rule of thumb is we're very alkaline already. And that would just add to more alkalinity. So skip the lime if you ever see it in a book. Uh, just ignore that. Take your Sharpie marker and get rid of it. Oh, I see someone has entered the room. You see that, Elizabeth? I did. Can you yeah. keep an eye on that for me, please? I will, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's why we... All right. So <laughs> I prefer mix everything together and put it in the bin. This is compost happens. Keep it simple. Getting to my next slide. There it goes. Uh, so you can mix in a wheelbarrow ahead of time. That's fine. Uh, you may need to add some moisture. You can see these leaves are, are relatively dry. So moisten that up so it feels like kind of a moistened, uh, slightly damp sponge. Adding more, uh, you, you want to bury uh, new material if you're keeping it hot in the middle of the pile because that'll reactivate and jumpstart the microorganisms that are starting to get hungry because they've been just breaking down all sorts of things. So if you're doing it hot, you put it in the middle. If you're doing it cold, you put it on the top of the pile. You wait one to two years and you're going to take it at the bottom of the pile to get your wonderful, great uh, compost. I pretty much mentioned everything else here. Um, again, we've talked about odor. One other reason you can get odor if the pile gets really saturated wet. This usually happens when the rainy season is upon us and then it gets kind of a sour smell. So you want to uh, keep the rain off of it by putting a lid. Uh, not that it'll keep oxygen out, just the rain. And if you can turn it and add something that'll bulk it up, you know, leaves or something like that, something that's on the dry side would help. 
uh, managing the pile, you would turn to reheat it if you're doing it in the hot method to add oxygen to keep uh, the decomposition um, process going at a fast rate um, to kill off undesirable weed seeds or for that matter, disease organisms. But again, 140 plus is where you need to keep that at for several weeks for that to happen. Um, if it should clump up or get layered, or if you have an odor, that's a good time to, to stir it. Uh, again, don't let it get too dry. Here is one thing I have had over the years or when people say I'm getting a lot of ants in my um, compost pile, usually it's because it's too dry. So ants generally like kind of the warm, drier areas to make a home. So wet it back up a little bit, but not too wet. But again, that'll really discourage ants more than anything else I can tell you. Curing or finishing, at some point if you're doing it hot, uh, you'll want it allow it to cool down and you won't add any more material. Um, sometimes people add earthworms. I don't recommend it. Um, you don't necessarily need to do that, but they'll finish off some of the things that the bacteria and fungi did not do. This can take uh, several weeks to months to cool down depending on how big your pile is and, um, and what you've been composting. Um, some of you have built sieves and screens uh, to remove the big chunky particles that didn't break down. You can see there's some wood chunks that haven't broken down and what you would do is take what got sifted out by, you know, back and forth and you would just put it back in the compost pile for another go around. It's kind of like when you have a dirty dish coming out of the dishwasher after a cycle and you look at it and go, oh, and you put it back in for another go around. See, that compost happens. That's what I love about this. I mentioned leaves, if you want them to break down more quickly, run your lawnmower over them several times. Breaks up that waxy layer on them and it really speeds up the process. Uh, if you're doing a lot of turning, a really good pitchfork will help. Um, you can uh, cover leaves, uh, the piles with leaves or even paper to avoid ants. It's kind of like mulching the pile. We don't think to mulch it because that surface dries out with the high sunlight and, and uh, airflow. Uh, this is time to employ a friend. I don't know what I was saying there. I don't know. Sometimes I can't remember. Help me out, Elizabeth. Thank <laughs> you for the laughter. There we go. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you, um, is there like a recommended uh, amount of time that you should, like how often you should turn it? Or Yes. The fast, if you want it in two to three weeks, then you're going to be doing it daily. Mm. And if you're like me, you never turn it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm waiting two years plus for, you know, the finished product. Wow. Again, compost will happen. The more energy you put into it by turning, getting that carbon to nitrogen ratio right there, perfect in the yeah. middle, it, the quicker it'll happen. But again, uh, the more you put into it, the faster you'll get it out. That's really the take home. Now, you can make compost uh, pile units out of something as easy as recycled wooden pallets. And a lot of times you talk nice to friends or you can go WW free on some of those um, internet sites where you can sell things and find wood pallets for free or very cheap. Some people screw them together. I've seen them zip tied together. Um, again, they work quite well to contain the pile and are usually easily available and generally free, my favorite word, or my second favorite word on the planet is cheap. So uh, you can do it that way. You can buy things. I'm not sure if my cursor is showing up, but this is, is. the lower uh, left-hand picture is, I, I got this off of one of those expensive, buy your friend who's a gardener, a fancy schmancy gift kind of uh, website. That bin back about 10 years ago was over $100 for essentially thick wire. Um, <clears throat> it's pretty, I guess, but not a, over $100 plus shipping and handling and tax. Uh, you can buy relatively inexpensive ones in the uh, right-hand picture. Those are probably about $30. Um, again, not, doesn't have to be fancy. It just has to contain it if you're going to do a pile. These are kind of nice if you're going to buy a unit. I kind of like them because you can see it has a lid on this one, and this one has a lid a bit bigger, a little more bulky to manage. That keep The lids keep out the heavy moisture. Uh, or rainfall from getting into the pile, which I like. And this is usually a cold composting uh, method because you really can't get in there from the top and, you know, 
turn and dig. So what happens is you put, you lift the lid up, you put your stuff down on the top. And if you notice down below, this one has a door that slides up or this one pops off and you go underneath at the bottom where it's all nice and broken down. It's kind of the method I do at my home. So it's put new stuff at the top, it breaks down slowly over one to two years on average and at the bottom is compost and it's easy peasy. If it's easy, we're gonna do it. If it's difficult, I don't know about you, I'm a guy, we try to avoid difficult things, don't we? I see Elizabeth smiling, thank you. Some people build these and I have seen blueprints or plenty of them on the internet out there. Um, I'll call it the Cadillac of them, uh, expensive. Uh, this one is the kind where you're gonna get in there with your pitchfork and move it from one to the other and back and forth. And you have one that's kind of uh, in the beginning process, one that's halfway through and hopefully you'll have some beautiful stuff on the other side uh, of the bins uh, ready for your for your gardening. I do have a question, Jim, um, yeah. <laughs> to um, aid in um, the molecular activity and all that um, and the heat. Uh, do you recommend a certain type of wood or a certain type of material or um, something like You're that? You're ahead of me by a little bit. <laughs> Good. I like it. She's paying attention. Great. All right. There are tumbling units out there. Um, look into them very carefully. Uh, I forget the name of this brand. It has a nice big door to put all sorts of stuff in. Mm -hmm. And if you look here on the side, you can see there are little teeth here and down here are, are uh, cogs or whatever. And over here is the handle that you turn. Notice how small this wheel is and how big this drum is. And these are all plastic, both the drum and the teeth. You yeah. add some weight and you try to turn that one revolution. It's mm -hmm. kind of like that poor little gerbil on the, on the, you know, <laughs> on, the on the wheel and he's spinning and going absolutely nowhere. Um, this unit used to sell for over 500 to almost $600. Wow. Yeah, I think there are better designs than this out there. Um, so if you go with the tumble unit, really kind of look at the mechanics out there before you invest in something that I think only works on paper. Hold on one second. There we go. Compost uses. Um, most of us will use it as a soil amendment because uh, it adds organic matter. Most of us will use it in vegetable gardening. Um, you will find out that when you add organic matter to any plant bed or vegetable garden bed that it was nice and deep one season and now it's a third the level the second season. Organic matter is going to constantly decompose. So a lot of times we don't add it to permanent landscape material, although you can amend a whole big bed. Don't amend an individual hole for a plant to do the whole bed. But most of us will use it in veggie gardening to improve the soil, or if we have annuals or other plants that uh, you know, benefit from having better water holding capacity. Uh, it creates a favorable environment for beneficial microorganisms. Many of these may help with plant diseases. Uh, it gives sandy uh, soil body to hold on moisture. Again, I like to think of it as soil glue, uh, especially in the sandy soil to hold on to water and hold on to nutrients that otherwise just flushes through sandy soil. But as I said, it's magical in that it breaks up clay soil and makes it drain better. It's just an amazing substance. <clears throat> what else? Um, some people use compost as a mulch. I probably would prefer just taking my oak leaves or something like that and put it on the surface of the soil and let it just naturally break down versus doing all that work uh, to make it into compost. A lot of people take the sifted compost so you don't have the big chunks in there and use it as part of a soil uh, potting mix. Um, you're gonna have to have something else besides just the um, organic matter, usually perlite and uh, or pine bark chips and some other things. Um, but potting soil recipes are kind of like lasagna recipes. My mother's was the best lasagna recipe out there. And Elizabeth's mother's recipe is the best lasagna recipe out there. Right, Elizabeth, you kind of shake your head. And everyone else is going, yep, and my wife's lasagna <laughs> recipe is the best. <laughs> everyone has the best recipe for it. Um, again, there's no one answer as to what's the best potting mix. The one that works for you is the best. It's now, right. I do have a question about that, Jim, as far as the um, potting mix. 
Is there like a, like a list of, um, of, uh, I guess stuff like either veggies or non edibles or whatnot that you should use this potty mix for and that you shouldn't use? Well, the potting mix would be for if you're potting up uh, flowers, annuals, vegetable transplants, mm -hmm. um, house plants. Okay. You know, now some, some plants will better drainage like a cacti or succulent okay. versus, you know, um, a petunia or um, okra. Gotcha. Yes. The it, it depends on the mix you use. And, and like I said, there are recipes upon recipes upon recipes for potting mix, for cacti, for uh, bedding plants, veggies, um, perennials, annuals, you name it. There, there are all sorts of recipes out there. And um, again, which is the one that's the best, the one you, you have used and liked time and again? Kind of like your mother's lasagna go-to recipe. Uh, some people make tea. Um, the idea is you take, uh, you know, several pounds of it and put it in a, usually some kind of sack. Uh, a lot of people will use a pillowcase, an old one, not, not a good one, an old one. And then they'll let the nutrients kind of ooze out and they'll use that as their um, fertilizer source. Uh, this has very few nutrients left in it at that point. Um, this can make a very weak nutrient starter solution for like seedlings or transplants, but it would not be my primary way to fertilize any plant in my landscape or my vegetable garden. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not a lot of good research on these uh, teas from compost. Part of that is compost varies from batch to batch, from year to year, uh, month to month. So your best way is to kind of skip that. It's a lot of work and it kind of gets icky looking and smelling and just put the compost, mix it in um, to the soil where you're gonna garden. Cause it really doesn't have that much in the way of nutrients. <clears throat> Some fads that have come, some have gone, thankfully, about 10 or so years ago, there was this big fad for dog food composting. I'm not sure if anyone remembers this, but you would add your veggie scraps, leaves, things from your yard, trimmings, and then you'd also add in a bag full of dog food. Now, dog food isn't cheap. And I think the idea is because it has protein, proteins are nitrogen, a green source, if you will, that it somehow jump-started the um, composting process. Um, when this started up, I started getting a lot of calls about people having a lot of vermin issues in compost piles. Mm. Are you putting meat or grease or bones? No. Mm -hmm. Dog food, I finally figured out, seemed to be the common denominator because it has meat, it has oils, it has, you know, everything we tell you don't put in the compost pile. <laughs> so, do not start it with dog food. Um, you can go online or you can go to garden centers and they have various compost starter um, bags. Usually it's one to five pound bags, kind of like um, flour or sugar is sold. And the idea is that it'll jumpstart or provide beneficial organisms to it. And here's answering your question, Elizabeth. You don't need to buy any of this. Remember the title is Compost Happens. There's mm -hmm. bacteria on all the surfaces of everything you put into your compost pile. There's fungi, there's fungal spores. All this is right there for free. And if people remember, my favorite word was free. You don't need to buy this. And in fact, a lot of times, whatever was probably put in there is probably long dead. You know, these things don't live forever in a dry box in a hot, hot store or in a warehouse. Mm -hmm. I can't think of any other gimmicks out there. Did I answer your question on additions? You did. Thank you very much. Do you uh, want to do a little poll? And see? Oh, we're almost there. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, ooh, crud. Sorry, folks. Let me do that again. Well, I got out of my... Um, there you are. Uh, it's going to be hard to see, but let me uh, share a couple of questions. If you'll take a moment, this is kind of interactive, and we have a couple of questions I'd like to have you answer. And scroll down on this one. It has several in a row, but you can scroll, and it starts with what was your knowledge prior, and then it asks you what it's after on the 
various things about composting. So I'll be quiet a moment so you folks can read and think. Hi, Jim, this is Jennifer. I am looking at a screenshot of all your slides. Did you want that to show? No, I got out of the program and I'm trying to get back in it while you guys are uh, filling in the poll. How's that? Got it, thank you. Hey, we're doing all right so far. All right, can everyone see the poll? Can I ask a question, Jim? I'll answer questions in a moment, okay? Thank you. All right, it looks like most of you have been able to access the poll. Thank you. I'll close that in another couple of seconds in case you're still finishing up. <clears throat> Mine won't submit. Oh, it went. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm here. Okay. Well, I won't. Uh, Go into all the details, but you can see a lot of you were at three. Most of you are at five with the second question. Thank you. Good job. Start at three to fours. Or at four to fives. Started with mostly fours. And wow, look at that. Mostly fives. Always good to see. I have one more question to ask of you, and then I'll answer questions. Let me launch the next poll. I got it. Stop sharing. And this one will be a little shorter and easier. And just hit submit at the end when you finish. Got a couple other people still answering, it looks like. We'll close this maybe another 10 or so seconds.
All right, I'll close that. And here you'll see a lot of you want to uh, install a compost bin, good. I know some of you have restrictions in your uh, neighborhoods. So make a little hole and bury it somewhere in your uh, yard with the HOA people can't see it. Thinking about recycling food waste, Excellent. using finished compost, great. Um, good to see, thank you for uh, sharing that with me. Now I know I had a question, you'll need to go to the lower left hand side of your screen and hit a mute and if we have a question, we'll try to get them. <laughs> Jim, I had a comment. Yes, hey. Um, we know that vegetables can be used, the scraps and everything, but maybe a slight reminder that if you've got a salad and there's just a little bit left, that if you have added salad dressing to it, it does not go in the compost. That's a really good comment, and that's because of the grease oil, even though it's maybe vegetable oil based, um, you know, salad dressing. So, yeah, thank you, Dorothy. You're welcome. I should add that to the slides, is what I'm hearing. Hi, this is Tanya. I was just wondering, um, I'm working and <laughs> watching this at the same time, and I had to. Um, miss a few things are you going to send us a link to the recording yeah it'll end up uh these have to be processed after they're done and uh, among other things we have to close caption it um and then get it out onto youtube it takes a while we're working on that but it'll be on and that we'll be sure follow us on facebook and that, that's where you'll probably find the information or our pasco county extension website Jim, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, hi, Mona. Hi. So recently, I have taken down this thicket of dead vines and branches, and there, I probably have it four feet tall, at least, and probably 20 feet long. Beyond chipping it, is there anything I can do to help it decompose quickly? Uh, chipping is your best. After that, not really because um, that's so um, chunky that adding a green source like a fertilizer material is just going to sift right through. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, something low to the ground like wood chips. If you had four or five inch layer of wood chips from a tree, but something like all that's going to go through. So it's going to be a long process. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm not going anywhere. Good. I like <laughs> to hear that. <laughs> Thank you, Mona. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> Other questions, comments? Hey, Jim, this is Bob. How are you? Good, Bob. Long time no see. Yeah, really. Um, a lot of people burn small branches and things in 55 gallon drums, and they have all the ash. We've had a few questions about taking that ash and dumping it into compost. Very carefully and slowly. It kind of works like lime in the sense that okay. it's very alkaline, but it does have a lot of uh, potassium, which is good for plants. So a little bit, don't, don't put heaps and tons. Okay. It'll raise the pH of something extremely alkaline uh, or caustic, if you want to think of it that way. And yeah, caustic. Yeah. Caustic and be um, toxic to the um, microorganisms just because it's a pH where they can't function. You know, okay, thank you. Not necessarily poisonous. But close. Yeah, well, it's like yeah. if you want to go on the opposite side, it's like lemon juice preserves because of the acidity. Yeah. Or pickles because it's very acidic. So when you get to one end or the other of the pH scale, microorganisms don't do real well. Okay. Jim, I had a question, it's Elizabeth. I had a question about um, condiments. Um, when Ms. Dorothy brought up, um, uh, you know, the salad dressing made me think of uh, mayonnaise has uh, typically oil in it and yep. like uh, peanut butter and stuff like that. So none of that can be composted. I would not compost down uh, mayonnaise because it has egg, mm -hmm. it has oils, salt, uh, et cetera, et cetera. 
ketchup, high in sodium, sugars, um, also mustards, things like that. Now, peanut butter, mm -hmm. you know, that's just generally ground up peanuts, but uh, some of these brands have hydrogenated oils. Mm. And they're the kind that don't separate yes. at room temperature. So that works like a grease. So I would say stay away from that. Uh, a peanut butter sandwich, mm -hmm. don't compost bread. Because there are oils and fats, sometimes egg, uh, other things added to that. So don't don't compost bread. A lot of times you'll get vermin when you do that. Mm. Thank you. That's why you have a dog. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Anybody else out there? Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Yes, Jim, I, I have one, one problem. It's not about composting, but Bob O'Brien has no video. He was able to hear the whole uh, pr presentation, but he has no video. Did he phone? Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll talk about that maybe off. Another, okay. Yeah. Um, Thanks. But um, depending on what kind of device he has, or um, for that matter, um, the phone in. Any? All right, everybody else is out, right? Questions, anybody? Here's my contact information on the last screen. If you didn't catch it, that's my email address. If you have questions, you can also call the office, even if we're not in the office because we're doing a lot of this virtually or this is a recording. Mm -hmm. We can get back to you when we're in the office or it rings uh, remotely, you know, mm -hmm. remotely uh, until we're back in, in the real world in person in our offices. So you can always get a hold of uh, Extension or myself in these various uh, manners. So until we meet again, either in the real world or cyber world, thank you. Have a great Earth Day. Uh, Happy Earth Day! Many, many more um, events like this online. Looks like uh, someone.